I had two talks, and but a lot of the subject matter overlaps. So I will give both the talks in 15 minutes so that you won't waste your time repeating the same thing again. So the basic problem here is that no one wants to wear glasses anymore. When I started doing ophthalmology in 1995, the penetration of multifocal lenses or the concept of multifocality was really new in India. And uh, because of which, nobody used to ask us these questions. We never, there was no concept of neural adaptation. The patient came, they removed the cataract, they wore glasses, they paid you and they went home. That's it. The neural adaptation came along with the multifocal lenses where you had to wait for the patient to get tired of coming back to the clinic and asking you question and question and then go away eventually. So they neurally adapted to it. Also, no one wants to be old anymore. This gentleman bought a Lamborghini at 85. He said, when I was young, I was poor. I'm rich now, so why not? You notice he's not wearing glasses either. And of course, uh, the beloved Hugh Hefner also never wore glasses and was very fit until he was 90 years old. So isn't the bifocal implant adequate for cataract surgery or a refractive lens exchange? When we started out doing multifocal lens implants for cataracts and sometimes for breast biopia, the only lenses on the market were bifocal lenses. There was no concept of trifocality or extended depth of focus. So the patient saw distance and he saw up close here. And that was okay because devices hadn't hit the market yet. Imagine if you are the pilot of this aircraft and you are 50 or 55 years old and you are press biopic. How will you look up and see all those switches and what's written there? Because everything is at 30, 40, 50, cent, uh, 50 or 45 centimeters. There is nothing which is at 12 inches. So traditional bifocals and the traditional bifocal lens implants would be a complete failure. Our colleagues in the operating room, no one operates at 12 inches with their head stuck in the patient like that. Looking for books in a library, even though soon there will be no more libraries and only devices. So the key is intermediate vision. What Jerome was just saying is that the new generation of patients that we are operating are extremely happy with having intermediate vision and now and then having to wear glasses when they want to see something up close in poor light. Which is why, even though I am not getting paid by Zeiss, this is the lens I am using at present which is my press biopic lens of choice. I do a lot of press biopic surgery. Patients come to me after 48, 49 years old. That's my cutoff. So I analyze them, I give them a questionnaire just like uh, your aunt did to see what kind of person is this. Is this person going to come every week to your clinic and be unhappy and sit in the waiting room and tell the other 20 people there that he put lenses and now I can't see. So if it's that kind of person, then you dissuade them and you don't do it. Otherwise, in goes the AD Lara, which is basically a E off lens. So the, it's a, basically a low act multifocal. So if you see the graph there, it's about 1.9 diopters in both eyes. I still do use the Lisa Tri or the old generation trifocal lenses, but in older patients. And the reason for that is that people who are 60, 65, 70 in India still read books. Yeah, I know it sounds amazing, but they still read books, but 45, 50, there's no book anymore. Everyone has a Kindle or an iPad or serves everything on the phone. My mother-in-law hasn't read a book in years, she sees everything on the phone. So vision at all distances is still the holy grail of cataract surgery. And which is why I much prefer the extended depth of focus lenses that's the fourth one there. But still, when with older patients, uh, 60, 65 and up, I ask them, would you be okay with wearing reading glasses now and then? They say, no, we just want to read. We don't drive, we don't care about what's happening in the distance. Then they get a trifocal lens. But all the younger patients uh, and people with a more active lifestyle automatically get the AD Lara, which is, uh, uses residue and corneal aesthetic for focus extension. While the laser try is minus 0 0.18. So you give them sharper near vision and decent distance vision, but more clear and halos. And I feel that multifocal lenses, 
basically people are reading the same as they did 10 years ago, 12 years ago, but new designs have less glare and less halo because the diffraction step height is less. Some things that you got to remember, if you are still using an old A-scan and touching that probe to the eye, just forget it, don't do it. Optical biometry is a must, if you don't have it, send it to a center which has optical biometry to get the exact measurements because 90% of the game is getting a 0, 0 result or a 0, 0, 0.25 plus or minus. Anything more than that, God forbid if they are plus 0 0.5, you had it. You won't see distance, you won't see near and be complaining all day. Patient must have 0 0.5 cylinder or less pre-operative, verified on corneal topography. Remember that all your biometers are measuring at certain points and the only true corneal power comes from corneal topography. Which is why Warren Hill in his lectures still uses that old Atlas topographer from Zeiss, which is as old as me, but then still gives you a good corneal topography so that you don't have a nasty surprise afterwards. And try to insist that the patient wants extended depth of focus lenses or they want trifocal lenses do bilateral surgery. I've been doing bilateral surgery for multifocals for more than 16 years now. And now and then when patients are very finicky and they want to operate only one eye, we've had the nasty surprise where after the surgery and the trifocal lens is in the eye, he looks through the other eye which has a great three cataract and says he sees better. That's because all the multifocal lenses split light and reduce your contrast sensitivity. So now and then you're going to have the situation where the patient comes back and says, well, you operated me, I can read the chart, but in the real world I see better with the other eye which has a cataract. So what to do if a patient has cylinder? We prefer to put in a toric lens, the first shot, rather than having to do LASIK later on or do laser LRIs. Everyone has run out and bought a femtosecond laser cataract system and when I ask them that how much difference does it really make, and we have a catalyst and we use it too, is that oh you know everyone's very happy with it and we can do LRIs. So we've been using the system for four years and what happens that after two or three years the efficiency of that laser LRI starts to decay, the astigmatism comes back. Now you've got a patient whose cylinder has come back and you're scared to do LASIK because when you cut the flap you will get a ridge there. So in this kind of situation I would much rather just put in a toric lens. We use these electronic markers, you can see the timestamp of 2013. This is what we were doing where we used a toric marker like this with the patient sitting upright. So this is Akaushi's toric electronic marker which is the most, absolutely the most accurate way to do manual marking. But nowadays we are doing markerless system with a Calistro and those of you who have used this, this is absolutely the best. Calistro or Virion is the best way to do a toric lens. There's no two ways about it and now the Iowa Master 700 has got the total corneal power, the anterior and posterior corneal power measurements. So here when we put a lens, the measurement from the Iowa Master 700 goes in and we see it on the heads up display like this. So even if the patient was like this when you did the measurement, the lens power calculation will still be absolutely exact because the landmarks will be the same. So it is taking its virtual landmarks here and then creating a, a model so that even if your patient was head was not perfectly straight because like this makes no difference cylinder is born in 90% of cases. Now when to plan monovision trifocal one eye mono the other eye. A lot of patients come to me with a monofocal lens in one eye they say well you know we met a friend operated by you you put in multifocals can we become multifocal? So the answer is yes. So there are many studies that have tried this before where one eye is more focal and you put in an uh, EDOF or a trifocal lens in the other eye. But you have to remember the patient has to want to be spectacle free but has to be okay with wearing near glasses sometimes and you have to tell them this point blank before the surgery and not be scared that they will run away. Under promise and over deliver. It's very easy to sit in the chair and say oh it's perfect, come tomorrow morning, everything will be fine and then when it's not fine uh, that's why you get sued. So unilateral multifocal implantation is not new. Sioni and Osha have studies from way back 
When most patients can read quite well, it's just a single lead off a trifocal implant in one eye and the other eye presbyotic or monofocal zero Another study showed that binocular visual functions that refract in multifocal intraocular lenses in patients with unilateral cataracts improved stereopsis as well and patients read and saw distance well. So what if the patient has already been implanted with a monofocal in one or both eyes? So we have a whole population of people operated in early 2000s or late 90s with monofocals. They come and say, now we want to be multifocal. We don't want to wear glasses at all. So we are using this sulcofix piggyback lens to create polyseurophakia in both the eyes. It's a new hyperferic acrylic lens that we are implanting, which is basically a peel-off piggyback lens. So tips for safe, immediate, sequential bilateral lens implant surgery is that we plan the incision, location, topography, IOL master and everything beforehand. We don't leave it for the time to get on the eye. First, wash the right eye repeatedly, operate it, use a separate moxifloxacin vial for intracameral at the end, then use a separate operating set, trolley, viscoelastic and machine. So what mistake people used to do was, they would operate one eye, then they would just use another handpiece and operate the other eye. But remember that the irrigating fluid would be the same and uh, the same oxyfloxacin vial they would put in the other eye. So we have to use everything separately. So remember that one happy press by your patient sends another patient. So this is really a value added addition to our practice where we are doing a lot of press biopia. Remember that my cutoff is 48, 49 years. Even before that, if the patient says, Oh, I want press biopic lenses and I want a lead off lens, and I read this and I asked Dr. Google, and he said that, you know, you can put this lens, don't do it. Because their vision at 45 or 47 with the residual accommodation is sometimes better than the vision that you can give them after putting in a lens. So that's the end of my talk. Now, before I get down from the stage, I have a very happy privilege of, I would like to present a Professor Eva and Dr. Jerome Bove uh, with a copy of a book called Like Sugar in Milk. So, the United Nations did a project on uh, the Parsis coming to India. So, we are Parsis. We came to India about a thousand years ago from ancient Persia. With the Arab invasion came in and some of us ran away from there because it wasn't a very happy place to be at that time. And we came to the coast of India and the king there said that should I let you in? Will you, will you create trouble in my country? So the head priest took a cup of milk filled to the brim and put some sugar in it. He said we will sweeten the milk and the milk did not overflow from the cup and that's why they let us into India. India has been a haven for refugees like us for over uh, 1500 years. So I would like to present Professor Jerome Bode and uh, Professor Eva with the book.